And what's that stuff coming out the back of the horse? Uh, those are the pipes working. Okay. That's I think normal. that was breakfast. <laughs> Hi. Oh, any old part of the hall will do. Dick and the nipples and the toenails, too. Hey, what's that swimming in the big red pan that's kicking up all this mania? It's Scrabble, Scrabble, the pride of Pennsylvania. Hello, hello, everybody. Dennis Allen here. Nobody in the car wants to hear me singing, or I would sing a whole melody for you. <laughs> Who's that in the back? That's Anastasia! And look, it's Logolicious with the Logoliciouses. So today is a big day. I ordered some extra rain for it. It is the Woodward Back to Basics. Is it a festival? I don't remember. Back, Future Dennis put the thing up here. That's what's going on today, people. And you are gonna have front row seats because my task since I am a learner homesteader, um, and this is like a homesteader 101 course, I get to video it because I don't know what the heck I'm doing, and I get to learn everything. This is my job here on YouTube and in life, and then one day maybe I'll be an expert and I'll teach maybe even next year. So we are just driving down Penn Creek Road. Oh, that's probably weird with the camera, huh? We're gonna make a right. The detour says make a left, but that's just to trick the non-residents. Two-way traffic. There's a sign right there. Thank you, Jesus. Look at that house. The lady is like 190 years old. There's Warren. Look at Warren, everybody. There's Warren. Hi, Warren. Warren's a cool guy. Warren is one of the main homesteaders here. Uh, I probably should have parked here. Okay, we could kind of block traffic a little. Yeah. Remember everybody, when I'm driving and filming, there's a tractor trailer pulling us. Anastasia, you see that, right? Yep, I sure do. There you go. Anastasia, she said next year she's gonna apply for the job of the tractor trailer driver. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna park here just to kind of slow down traffic and let people know, hey, there's a show. All right, everybody, let's go. Don't you know, to the show, I gotta go. Oh, nope. Hey! <laughs> There's a rainbow top Amish. <laughs> Alright, there he is. This is who everyone's been waiting for. We're gonna start off in a few minutes. And we're gonna get Homesteader Dan to show us around town. And that's Hank. Not Hank the tank, Hank's the horse. Big as a tank, but it's Hank. And there's Sam. Sam I am, I fix your horse as fast as I can. Hey, that'll be a good slogan. Uh oh. That horse doesn't like tank, tank. All right, here's the official kickoff to the event. Dennis is ready. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to the human farm. Um, Mike and Amy, who are the. Mike, right over there. I see him. This is Amy. She's in charge of what's happening today. And Mike is busy all the time, so we'll just let him stay busy. He's better when he's busy. Um, he asked me to talk a little bit for him. I don't really think I like to talk. But, uh, I guess I do. I, like I to second that. Myself. Um, <laughs> So, we just want to talk real quick and then we'll let you get back to what you're doing. Uh, my name's Dan. Dan, not Dan. Dan. Um, on Instagram, I'm Homesteader Dan and the school is Farmer Dan. Uh, I help with the gardens. Um, Dennis and I are going to be going around after we talk here to each station and doing a little talk about what's going on there. Uh, I'm going to try to let the people at the station do most of the talking, but we're going to try to pry a little information out of them while we're there that maybe people aren't getting otherwise because we kind of know the questions to ask them. Um, and Warren is just going to do a quick talk about homesteading in general and, and what it is and you know what's happening with it maybe nowadays compared to 100 years ago. I don't know exactly what he's even going to talk about. So why are you talking? <laughs> <laughs> Homestead fights. This is Warren. This is another homesteader. Yes. Uh, so, down off playing, off the playing yeah, I'm Warren, and I'm not on Instagram. I'm not anywhere. <laughs> I just got to come visit me. Anyway, so homesteading in the old days was one thing. They did it because they had to. They didn't have 
anything but what they built with their hands. They used to get something out of the old Sears and Roebuck catalog called a homesteader's kit, and in it there would be like a forge, a hand-operated drill press, anvils, and hand tool, a bunch of hand tools, some gardening tools, a whole kit boxed up on the train, horses bring it to your little farm at and you go. Nowadays, like Mike is doing, you have to collect this stuff from sales and stuff and try to bring it back into working condition. And that's a lot of fun right there. That's one of the reasons we do it. Another reason is because there's a lot of pride and, and worth in making things with your hands and having the food you grew building the things you need and maintaining them. All that kind of stuff is really a worthwhile thing to do, and that's why a lot of us do it. In the seasons, you have to do things relative to the season. On the day, if it's rainy, you don't stand out in the rain unless it's like for doing the day. <laughs> normally, you would have things like doing rugs, making bread, um, building things in the wood shop, whatever you would do under roof in a rainy day. So the weather mattered to then, and it matters now to homesteaders. Homesteaders today are saving a lot of money because they're producing a lot of their own stuff. They're getting food that they know how to raise, raising their own animals, raising their own gardens, canning, all that kind of stuff, drying stuff, putting things by, and all that can be had on your own place. There's people I've heard of that are doing it on like two acres, and they produce everything they need just about. Sure, you have to get some things in, like maybe you don't grow wheat or something like that, but you could grow some. All of that stuff um, gives you a, a lifestyle that is healthier, and you get to know your neighbors, at least the ones that are homesteaders, and share all those recipes and how to do things. That was a big part of the culture of homesteading. Um, and so what we have here today is examples of little pieces of a homestead. They aren't all here. There's even more than this in, in a homesteader's life throughout the year. But when you do the things that you do throughout the year, you do them relative to the time of the year, but you also do them relative to the tools you have and each tool and each system you have set up. If it can be used in multiple ways, that's a, that's a, a plus. Like, Today, a phone is used for one thing or whatever, but back then, a hammer is used for how many different things, and a shovel, on and on. So, multiple use, that's a big thing. A homesteader knows how to do a lot of these different things. Sometimes, if you have neighboring homesteaders, they specialize in things, like maybe they're a blacksmith. One of your homesteaders is a blacksmith. That's where you go for that stuff. Maybe one of your homesteaders is really good at butchering. But in the old, old days, you did it all. And nowadays we try to kind of do as much as we can because it's fun. That's another, that's another main reason we do it. So now, that's enough said about homesteading unless you have any particular questions. But we're going to go around and talk to the people and see what they have to show. Sound good? Get all your information. Let's do it outside right now because it's yeah. a joke. Yeah. Look at it, it was a joke. <laughs> okay, here we are today at... Uh, Huey Farm for Back to Basics, and we are going to talk to Jesse about making and drinking kombucha, and hopefully why it's good for us to do that. Oh. Okay, so uh -huh. kombucha is um, it's fermented black tea, so you, we use sugar to help to assist the fermentation, um, but hopefully most of the sugar gets fermented out um, before you drink it. So it's kind of a it's a lovely effervescent. Uh, mm -hmm healthy probiotic beverage. Um, my kids call it bubbly tea. So we just, we, in our house, it's just bubbly tea. Um, so it took me a long time to realize it was pronounced kombucha. Um, yeah, it's, so we use, we use a continuous, we do a continuous brew method. So this jar just sits on the, it sits on the counter. We drink some of the tea every day, and then we fill it back up with like a fresh um, black tea. Like, so it ferments, a little, it ferments overnight, we drink a little bit. If, as long as the kitchen is nice and warm, it ferments overnight and then it's ready again in the morning. This is right. um, on top here, that's called the SCOBY. That stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. Um, and that's what ferments it into, you know, culture rather than just simply. So where does that come from? Where do you get the SCOBY? The, the SCOBY, you have to, you have to have a starter. Like, it's you have community. To, yeah, sure. exactly. You, have to, you, from you have to have a friend who had one, or if you're real desperate, you order one online. Um, but you only need a tiny piece, and then you can grow it like forever for yourself. 
So every does every jar you make reproduce another? So since we do con continuous fruit, our mushroom just, it sits at the top and it gets thicker and thicker as it sits in there. Mm -hmm. um, other people do kind of let it sit for a week or two. They just, they'll fill up a jar, put in a little bit of starter, mm -hmm. and let it sit for two weeks. And then it does grow a nice thick mushroom on its mm -hmm. own. Um, but the way we do it, our mushroom just kind of gets thicker and thicker until it's ridiculous and it takes up half the jar. And then we <laughs> take them on top the other way. So Could you split it? Like, you know, yeah. take a layer off yeah, and make a note? Oh. Yeah, oh. you can peel it off, give it to your friends. So why would we drink kombucha instead of, say, Coca-Cola? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so Coca-Cola, let's not talk about high fructose corn syrup. That's yeah. not my thing, but that's not what I want to drink. Um, the kombucha is alive. It's a, it's a fermented culture, and it's good for your belly, like especially maybe not in the quantities that we drink it, but in small quantities, it's got, you know, the bacteria that's going to help you digest your food and make your belly feel better. Um, also doesn't come in plastic bottles. And it, does, it always, <laughs> yeah. does it always taste the same every time you make it, or do you add flavors to it? Um, we do add flavors. So this one is, so we, we re, re ferment ours once it's ready to drink. Um, sometimes we'll take these bottles and fill it up. This has pear, nectar, and ginger in the bottom. Mm. In the summer we love, we do peach. Peach is our favorite. Um, so anything with a little bit of extra sugar in it, hopefully natural sugar, will help it re-ferment. So we, put, we fill up, a, you know, just the bottom with some fruit and then fill it up with the tea and, and cap it and then leave it maybe a day to, to ferment and that makes it kind of extra bubbly. And then you can store the bottle in the fridge and you can keep it for a long time um, just in that state. We love to do the flavors, especially since my yeah. kids are drinking it, but peach. Yeah, well, that's a big crazy. thing nowadays. People don't want to just drink water. I mean, yeah. You have to drink plain water, but they don't want to drink things unless there's some kind of flavoring in it they, that they like. So, you know, use some good flavoring. Um, fruit is very good. Um, I use elderberry juice. Uh, we, we make our own elderberry juice, and that gives you, you know, your fermented thing plus some... Um, Antibiotic um, properties, or uh, not antibiotic. Uh, yeah, lost my train of thought. So Probiotic. <laughs> edit that. Probiotic. Probiotic. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it you know the other berries are, are a great source, just like other berries. Um, and Jesse has some uh, free samples here. If anybody would like to try some. Yeah, samples. Mm -hmm. And we even have extra scobies. If you really love it, you can take it home and start it for yourself. So here we are, uh, we're going to talk about making your own sauerkraut at home. Warren is going to uh, give us some information on how to get it chopped up and get it to taste like sauerkraut. Nice. So first you got to grow a cabbage, usually done in the spring and the fall around here. This is a full crop. Cut your cabbage, clean it all off, cut it into a piece like this, and you put it into this very old slicer. This slicer has a an adjuster here that where you can make the slices of whatever vegetable it is you're slicing thicker or thinner. And just slice it. This is obviously the thickness that he likes to do it at. Put this down. And you can get through you can get through a lot of cabbage very fast. This cabbage is then put into a crock like over here on the ground. Put in a layer like about that much sprinkle a little handful of salt on it, candy salt, and then you take a stomper. Stomper. Oh. Hey. Looks like a stomper to me. Sauerkraut stomper. And, you, and you're, you're working you're working the juice out of the pieces of shredded cabbage and the salt helps bring that out also. And then you just do another layer, stomp it again, another layer, stomp it again, and you go it up to about here cover it with some cheesecloth and sit it in a place in your house that's like the average temperature in your house is just fine. And then it works for about six to eight weeks. Um, or, no, not cheesecloth, sorry, I was thinking of a different thing. There's a cap, there's a lid that you normally put on these things. Should have a week. They may, in the old days, they had a round wooden cap that you sit on it and you put a rock or a brick or something on it and it holds it down of the liquid and covers it kind of just a little bit. You can also use a plastic bag full of water or whatever will seal it and keep the moisture in and keep 
outside stuff from getting in it. If it gets a little bit of gooey mold on the top of it, it's no big deal at all. You just take that and throw it away. The stuff that's under it is fine. And that mold's not going to hurt you at all. Six to eight weeks, put it in jars, canning jars, put it on your shelf. Don't tighten the lid the whole way, just in case it's still working a little bit, like that. And then you're, you've got sauerkraut for the year. Big one, yeah. All right, where did you get the bowl? Trying to figure out what's going on next. Okay. Um, can you close that door? If everybody can gather around here, if you're interested, we're going to talk to Sarah about healing herbs, growing your own herbs and using them for healing. And just so you know, and I'm sure Sarah will remind you. This information is for educational purposes and is not intended to treat or diagnose any medical condition. We're not trying to tell you that it doesn't work. We're trying to tell you that, you know, before you start doing all this on your own, you need to talk to somebody like Sarah or another naturopath or herbalist or just because you don't want to do too much or too little of anything and go the wrong way with your medical problem. So, so Sarah, what can you tell us about your... It's healing herbs you have here today, basically. So, today I'm making echinacea tincture. A lot of people are familiar with this. This comes in the little brown dropper bottles, and people take it through the winter to support the immune system, to fight off colds and flus. Um, a lot of people know echinacea. It's this beautiful plant that blooms in the summer. It's also called purple cone flower, and it has these great, gorgeous purple petals, and the butterflies love it. So anyone with a garden should really be growing echinacea. Um, because not only is it a butterfly magnet and a U.S. native, um, but it has great medicinal properties as well. So over the summer, I harvested the flowers, the seed heads and flowers, and I made a tincture. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to use herbs. Obviously, fresh out of the garden is a great way to do it, but sometimes we don't have them. Like I said, those flowers aren't here anymore. So... A lot of what we do as herbalists is just kind of work to find a way to preserve it so that we have them in the winter months. And one of the best ways is to tincture things. Um, if you get just a straight 100 proof vodka, which is 50% alcohol and 50% water, um, you can do what's called the simpler's method. You just pack the herbs in a jar and cover them with vodka. And that will keep for years if you have it in a cool, dark place. So what I'm gonna do is use this tincture that I made out of the flowers and I'm gonna use it to re-tincture the root so I'll have what's called a double echinacea tincture. And this is one of four quarts that I made and we'll go through mm -hmm. probably a gallon of echinacea tincture in my house this winter. And it, wow. it works. We haven't been sick in years. Mm -hmm. Real wood here too. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about herbs? Everybody like their soup? So when you grow echinacea in the garden, yeah. can you harvest it the first year? What I recommend and what most herbalists I know do is you can harvest the flowers the first year, but you want to harvest third year echinacea roots. So if you start it from seed, it might not flower the first year. You can harvest flowers the first year you see flowers, um, but you're going to wait until the third year that root has grown the third fall. So after three summers, and you can harvest it then. And is the tincture the liquid? Yeah. Or what's floating in the liquid? Um, it is the liquid. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the tincture is what's called the menstruum. Any liquid that you use to preserve herbs is called a menstruum, and alcohol is one particular menstruum. And I can pass this around. You guys can smell it. It's pretty um, total. Do you take that every day or like when you feel like you might be getting sick? I take sick? it when I feel like I might be getting mm. sick or if I've been around mm. someone. Smell it on the camera. Okay. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> smell of it. Do you have a um, thing, Steve? Just oh, your mouth that does smell good. Your food? I want to smell it. I just smell it. I smell it. I already smelled it with my camera. <laughs> the pig butcher. Look at that, people. Half pig. There's the other half. You want to get in there? Check it out. You eat meat? You should be watching this. Different stages.
with that. Those go on there, as in here. And then this is their burning, boiling the meat. This one's just water. Here is the processing table. Those are those cuts, nose cuts, nose cuts. Wow, that looks so good. One pig just came off of the rack, and here it is on the table. These are the different parts. Today we're going to talk to Brian here real quick about what, what he did from the time he got here today, you know, when the pig came out of the barn, well from yesterday, the pig was in the barn, and now there's still some laying around, but a lot of it's been processed and starting to be packaged and put away, but if, if and you could, eaten. <laughs> and eaten, and if you could, Brian, talk about all the different things you're going to do so we don't waste any of the pig. Okay. Uh, what we did already is we rendered... We took all the lard that was on the pigs, we put it through a grinder and ground it all up and we put it in two kettles and then there's a lard press over there. We, we cook it We cook it down if there's no moisture left in, in the fat particles and uh, then you get the lard out of it. And uh, then we'll run it through the lard press over there and squeeze it down that it makes a, all the particles make a fat cake. But all it is is just the leftover meat that was on the fat and the hard stuff. And then we put that in containers and we use it for year round. It lasts for over a year. Keep it in a cool place. Uh, you can use it use it for different things. Use it for cooking. Yeah. You can use it for baking. You can use it for the soap process that Kathy's doing inside. Mm. Um, I'm not sure best, if people make makes candles. Best crust. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Yes. So it's one of them things that's got multiple uses. You don't want to waste it. You want to save every bit of that fat and use it for something. Yeah. Whatever's left over, you can either eat the cracklings yourself. It's like little fat. Don't meat, eat too meaty. much of that. No, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's good. I use it instead of uh, bread croutons on my salad. I put some of them on my salad. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> if you have chickens or other animals, they'd love to get some of that stuff. So you don't waste anything. It all goes to something on your homestead or your neighbor if he needs it. Oh, there's a good stuff. There you go. Taste that. Yummy, yummy. It's not good salt. No, it doesn't need salt. Say it again. I'm going to try it I love it. Yeah, I do want to try. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, what else did you make today out of your pork, Brian? The broth that you see sitting in the containers here now, what that was, was uh, we took the heads, cut them up, put the meat out, took the gulls out, threw them away and stuff. Uh, all the bones from cutting the pork up that we boned out to make sausage and stuff, all went in two kettles, water, cooked it down, made a broth out of it. Uh, we put everything on the table then and separated meat from the bones. Uh, and we're going to use that for our scramble and our liver cooking now. We'll put so much of it back in with the broth, along with uh, buckwheat, cornmeal, and flour, salt and pepper, and that'll make our scramble better. Hmm. Uh, liver, we'll take some of it out, because a couple of people want a little bit of liver pudding. It's just the head meat, the liver and stuff. Uh, put it back on the furnace. Uh, we'll get it that it's cooking real good, almost frying, frying itself. Then we'll put salt and pepper in it, put it in a crock, and it, it's natural lard. It'll be a natural lard that'll come to the top of it, it'll seal it off, and you can put it in a cold place and it'll sit there for a year. Just scoop the lard off of it, 
take your head meat out, put the lard back over it. Is this the best time of the year for processing like this? Yeah, I, me and myself, uh, I, I had butcher for 10 or 12 different places. I did, last year I did 130 homes. Wow. And, all and it starts from year. now until March. Well, the important thing is, and your question is, is a great question. Important thing is, you don't want to do it in the hottest summer. Right. You want to keep your temperature low. You know, it's better to do it. You know, probably around 40 degrees, so you're not getting bacteria and stuff in your meat. Right. You know, butcher shops have a, have coolers in their shop, and they keep their temperatures what right around 60, 65. Uh, no, actually, uh, USDA says they have to keep them about 45. Right. So, so they have to keep the temperature down, and that's a very important thing in in uh, preserving things is when you make things make sure you're doing them under the right temperature so you don't get bacteria in them things that's going to cause a problem later uh, just just like now now these hogs were killed yesterday so they hung all night the body heats all out of them because it came out of them overnight but if we would have done in the old days we would have killed them this morning cut them up right away we wouldn't have been able to let them lay there we would have to get it in the cooler as soon as on a day like today because it's just too warm for it. But okay. since we got the body heat out of it right. hmm. overnight, we're good to let it sit there Gives you more time. until we're ready to put it away. Right. Wow. But yeah, there's very little waste on a pig. <laughs> very little waste. I mean, when you're done, I notice there's two little containers sitting over there that have some bones in that just had a little bit of blood or something like that on. That's all, that's all the waste except for the hides pretty well. Wow. I noticed you made some sausage. I saw some sausage hanging in the smokehouse. Can you tell yes. us how you uh, uh, made the sleeve and everything or process? The sleeve is actually the intestines. Uh, they're turned inside out. They're rinsed out, scraped out, and all that's left is the outer, outer part of the intestines. <coughs> so they are completely clean. Uh, a lot of your butcher markets will use either hog casings or lamb casings. That's what most of your sausage is. Uh, your lamb casings aren't quite as big, so if you get a smaller sausage, you choose the lamb casings. Uh, we salt and pepper. A lot of people just do the old country style pork sausage, which is just salt and pepper. Or you can get creative. I'm sure, Dan, you get pretty creative on some of your sausages, don't you? <laughs> I actually, uh, we quit making a lot of sausage up front because then you make it and you always have the same flavor sausage until you do another pig. So we just grind the pork up, keep it in the freezer, and when we want sausage we take it out and we make little mm -hmm. sausage patties and then we we um, get whatever herbs or spices we want for that day. Oh. And it, it's not sure. absorbed in it for a long period of time but you still taste all them flavors. You know, you just throw some fennel seed in, some salt and pepper, a little rosemary, whatever you like, right there and there in the morning. That way. You you can have whatever flavor you want when you eat sausage. You don't have to cool. have the same thing. Um, as far as the smokehouse, I, uh, does he have sausage hanging in there? Yeah, I'll talk to Mike. Oh, yeah. All right, there's the last pig. Not here, raise your hand. Everybody here, raise your hand. Back in the old days, every farm had a smokehouse, obviously, to preserve meats. But you can also smoke cheeses, uh, mushrooms, peppers, you can smoke all kinds of things, fish. Now, as smoking, did you see? So, I don't know if you can see it, but in the bottom of this smokehouse, this is a typical old style smokehouse, there's a pit. Underneath that piece is tin. In that pit, he got a fire going with the kindling, and then he put old, uh, bigger, wet wood in, green wood. The green wood is usually like hickory, maple, cherry, walnut. There's a lot of black birch. There's a number of kinds of wood that work really well. Put them in there because and put the steel on top because it wants to smolder. You want it to just real slowly burn and smolder and smoke, 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 smoke. 
Again, this should be done when it's cooler out, like, like Dan was saying. It's just a better for keeping the meat cure, uh, healthy for you. Uh, some of the things that can be put in there, you can you just see this uh, sausage hanging up. Oh, yeah. Another thing is um, hams can be put in there, bacons can be put in there, all the things that he was talking about, you put them in there. And you smoke them, you have to keep putting wood in, and you do it over a three, depending on how big the pieces of meat are, three to four days a week, even if it's really big. However much smoke you like in the meat, you kind of get used to how much you can smoke. It's a thin little piece of fish, and it might only take a day. If it's peppers, it might only take four hours. Cheese. Another way of smoking, you can actually use hay and flash smoke. You throw it in there and you can imagine what hay would do. It's like real smoky, real fast, and then it's over. That's used for cheeses and thinner things that you're gonna smoke. Almost all the smoke houses were built about like this, kind of loose, so some of the smoke can get out. You kind of want the smoke to cycle through the whole building. You don't want it super fast. And they're all about this size, about 8 by 10 on all the farms I've ever visited. The size of the smokehouses were like this, because they used to smoke a lot of stuff, just like a friend over here was telling us about butchering. They smoked a little pig. Well, they smoked cows, they smoked chicken, they smoked turkeys. I, if I get a wild turkey or a tame turkey and put it in brine and smoke it in, uh, it's really delicious. Yeah, keep in mind, smoking is a flavoring, it's not a preservative. And also keep in mind that when you smoke things, the process does put nitrates in your meat in small amounts, but depending on how you smoke it makes a big difference on how much of that gets in there. i got to talk to Mike because I told you earlier that this smokehouse should have a vent on the top. It's letting smoke billow out the sides and stuff, but the toxins are billowing around in there with the smoke. They need to, they're light. They need to go directly out the top. And you can adjust the top so that all your smoke doesn't go out either. Uh, and like Warren said, keep your temperatures where they need to be. Don't don't let the smoke out go down overnight. I mean, the way people smoked things years ago, and you can read it in books, they smoked it overnight when it was cool, but then they let the fire go out during the day when they went to work, and they lit it back up. And that's fine if the temperature's cold enough. If it's warming up during the day, you smoke it overnight at 30 degrees, but if it warms up in the 50s and 60s during the day, and you start getting temperatures above 52 degrees, certain meats are going to start getting bacteria in them. So you got to watch your temperature. Very important to watch that temperature. I, in my smokehouse, I have a, a little thermometer. I can put one end of it in the smokehouse to monitor the actual smokehouse temperature because you don't want it to overheat while you're smoking unless you're not smoking. Even then, you don't want it to um, And then the other end goes into meat so I can monitor the temperature of the meat so I can take it out when, when it's um, hot smoking that's right after do you want to talk about hot smoking versus cold smoking or this is cold smoking here and it's mostly what they did in the old days and they did it in the winter for all the reasons he's saying hot smoking you can i don't know if you could do it in here so much but yeah usually in a smaller yeah. structure because you want it to get up to about 165 degrees or so in there whenever you're making things like uh, salami and sausages and bologna and stuff like that. You have to kind of cook smoke it. You can also smoke cook a turkey or a chicken or something like that. You can actually do that. Basically that's the difference. When you're, when you're hot smoking, you're actually cooking it at the same time. When you're cold smoking, you're just flavoring it and you're going to cook it later. Like bacon, you know, you're going to... Uh, it, it may cook on the outside a little bit, but basically the bacon is still going to be raw inside, but it's going to have the flavor. Uh, the other thing, when you're smoking, the more fat that's on the meat, the less, the more it's going to take the flavor to get into the meat because the fat doesn't absorb the smoke. It has to get through that to the meat. So you want to trim a lot of your outside fat off, but, but not all of it. Um, and that fat will get rancid yeah. before the meat goes. Right. When I when I cold smoke, I have a fire in a wood stove outside my smokehouse, so that all I'm doing is blowing the smoke in the smokehouse. There's no heat in there at all. So you can control the temperature a lot better and just get a cold smoke going into there. Well here, you're, you're gonna get a warmer smoke because the fire is right in there and though you got it smothered. Um, and then when you hot smoke, you build the fire up and let it burn a little hotter. And you're cooking it and smoking at the same time. And you also wanna be careful with the wood you use. You wanna use hardwoods, you wanna use fruit wood to get flavors. Um, apple wood's good flavors. Um, cherry wood gives you a sweet flavor. You can actually, while you're smoking, you can smell that sweet flavor in the air. You do not want to use softwoods 
it, every kind of wood has tannin in it when it when it burns, especially when it initially burns. And tannin is a toxic subject, substance. Um, so you don't want to use softwoods because that's even more toxic. A lot more tannin. I did some research on the smokehouse because I decided to build mine and I ran around the area looking at all the old farm smokehouses and almost all of them were 8 by 10 or 10 by 10 size. So I built an 8 by 10 and then I did what's called cold smoking. Now what he's doing in here is cold smoking because it's going to be underneath the metal cover. So it's kind of, the metal cover does a couple of things. Keeps the heat away from the and it slows the fire down to get the smolder so that the smoke just billows out around it. So it keeps it, and usually during the fairly cold, cold weather, it keeps it a certain temperature in there. But when you're doing stuff like ring bologna, it's supposed to get up to like 165 degrees while you're smoking it. Then you need the hot smoke, and then you have to do it in the casing right there it's junk oh it's what you're they eat. scraping from oh yeah, okay. I'm scraping out and then I'll I'll turn this sun side out and then that's what they'll put the sausage in then. I always wondered how the heck they made it I saw the <laughs> the casings before I was like how the heck did they do yep wow. I'm sure in the bigger spots they have um, machines, machines that yeah. do it. <laughs> But I enjoy doing But this, this is back to basics. Yep. This is how it's, uh, it's been done for yep. probably thousands of years. Now I don't know how to get them out to separate them, but I, I know how this... This is all one big thing. Yeah, it's all one big thing. This is the whole thing. Yeah, it's all one big thing. Yeah, so I guess like a human intestine, it just goes and goes, goes and goes. It goes and goes, and they're good ones too. Sometimes they rip and stuff, but these thin. But you can see this is, is... Yeah. And you're scraping it with that wood? Yeah. yeah. Somebody made me this night. So, this is our blacksmith station. And most of you probably already know that this has been going on for many, 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 many years. Many years, you know. They didn't have, you know, equipment to make all these things. And as you can see on the table, all the different things that were made, like these guys are doing here. And even look at this piece of equipment underneath you. And most of the parts on here, or all of them, were probably made by hand, formed by hand. Even the, you know, they even made rivets, like I was just talking about. They had to be made by hand. You know, they didn't have a factory down the road with people working there to make the rivets. Um, so I'm going to let Josh here and any of the other guys that want to fit in talk a little bit about what they're doing, and some of the different tooling they're using, um, and how they make some of these things in general. You know. All right. Yeah. Um... Well, we got two different forges here today. He's using a coke forge, and we're using a cool forge. They're both pretty similar. But uh, people, when they started forging, I think they originally just used wooden charcoal, and then cool and coke came later on, but it turned out to be a lot more efficient. Um, we, I guess we got three anvils here. The one here is usually how they traditionally put them in. I think they, they usually bury actually post in the ground and then mount a dam bill on it. But it's a lot easier to have a stand like this. Uh, basically, um, I don't know, a Tyler's been working on a really, I just finished. Right over here, this fella is. I'm forge welding, bar yeah. shield for a horse. And these bar shoes are used as a therapeutic for shoe for a horse, such as a horse with heel pain, something like that. So 
Back in the day when somebody needed a, a shoe for their horse, they couldn't just run down to tractor supply and grab whatever size they needed and make it fit. They had to go down to the blacksmith and wait for him to make him one out of a piece of stock. And he would make it to fit that particular horse or close to it. Well, they have, these blacksmiths have to have an eagle eye and they look at the horse's foot and shape it for each individual horse. Each individual foot. Well, they made, it's so like, like Dan said, they made all their hardware in the forge too. So I made a, a basic coat hook earlier to start. But they made stuff like this. They made all their, they didn't go, like he said, they didn't go to the hardware store. They made all their hooks and eyes themselves. And then all their hinges, well, their chains. The, like the nails, so you remember that. Actually, if you look at, and you do that real quick. look at a lot of the hinges on the old barms around here, they'll all be hand forged. If you start like something like this, they, they drew these out and they hand forged them. <coughs> Is this the Trevetti was working on earlier today? Or? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Josh, when you're pounding that hot red metal, what are the odds of pieces are going to fall out? I see nobody's wearing protection. Uh, we probably all should be wearing some glasses, <laughs> but yeah, it, it happens. Yeah. Um, I usually do, but I forgot mine today. Yeah. It's like the one thing I forgot to bring. But it, um, well, it's pretty, it, it's pretty that, good. There's scale that comes off of it, is that what you call it? Yeah. yeah. Slag, but there's not the metal. Yeah, but tool breaks. Yeah. Hammers and maybe you could miss it. Yeah, this is a cross pin here. That's, that's some of the tools they use. This is not an extremely heavy one, but hand that around. You know, just think about swinging that all day long. This guy here is probably, his right arm is probably quite strong as his left arm. Those. Might be a little longer too. <laughs> right, these are what are these called? Tongs. 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 There's different Tongs. styles. So these are called tongs. This is what you grab your yeah, um, horseshoe or piece of metal with. To uh, that needs a thicker piece. Just stick it in to your uh, forge to heat it up, so you're not uh, burning your fingers. Obviously. There's different styles of tongs too. Different pieces of metal you want to use a different tong to grip it. And these were probably hand forged. Yeah. They, they it wasn't that something we went and bought at the hardware store. We hand forged them. Right. So we had a tool to use. And, uh, these here are called Harvey tongs. <laughs> Where? Yeah. These are made. These are hardy tools. This is a cutting tool. But the, all the anvils have this. This is a hardy hole and this is a pricker hole. So we show them. This is used. These yep. are both used for punching, but the hardy tools fit in here, so you can cut things with that. Split yeah, things. You need that, you cut off. Uh, not right. Just yeah. scrap. Yeah, yeah, scrap something while he's talking. You can get a piece ready. We'll get a piece ready, and he can show you how you cut a piece off. But this, this is made for bending things. Out. But you don't, you don't see. Uh, you don't see a band falling. Same thing is in full effect.
piece of metal in there. That one would be on top of the These aren't saying we're getting those. These are going to run them down. I'm just trying to make that tip a little bit. Yeah, that's what Everything you could possibly use for your homestead. Here, to Dennis, make this look like your shipping containers. This is exactly what I want. That's how a shop should look, people. Propane heating that. Let's go see the tools. Oh, a Jeep. Wave. So these are all the things that the blacksmith make. The hearts out of a shoe. Here's a tinsmith. I'll show you that later. So we could make any shape and size fitting we wanted by doing what's called triangulation. And we'd use these, what are called dividers, similar to a protractor. And when I say triangulation, I should have brought a tablet of paper and maybe Dave will have it in there. But you're basically, a funnel is one of the easiest things to make. And this is basically a funnel with a cap on the end, right? It's a big side and a little side. All you need to do is get this radius and that radius and cut your piece of metal the right length and you make a funnel any length you want. So you basically make a triangle either on a piece of paper or a cardboard or you do it right on a sheet of metal you have. It's a trap piece. You get a square side. You draw this on the side. You draw the top which is what six inches six and a half inch diameter. You draw the bottom which is probably five down here with the length of whatever you want that to be. And you come all the way down here to the corner, and you get your top radius and you scribe a line. You get your bottom radius, which will be smaller, and you scribe a line. I wish I'd brought a paper. So you have two radiuses there on your piece of metal. You figure out what your length is going to be because you get the circumference of the diameter. So you know your top and your bottom length. You start here and you get that either by putting a... a metal rule that, that bows on there or you can take your dividers and put them on a circle drawn that size and, and go every so many inches or whatever you want to do and get your, your length, cut it, roll it up, rivet it together and you've got a funnel. If you want a smaller hole in it, you just you know make a smaller funnel to attach to it, solder it or whatever. Just The funnel is the simplest thing, but you can make anything. You can make one of these cups. Um, you can make a scoop for your grain. You can make a little another little tool chest. I made a sphere one time, a round ball, about this big out of sheet metal, completely closed up and everything, and I made a piggy bank out of it. I just wanted to see if I could do it. But I used a similar method of triangulation to do it. So you can make anything. 
All right, if you're not a, if you're just a, a little thing to throw in here as far as scoops and stuff, so you're not wasteful in your homestead, if you need a scoop and you don't have a tinsmith in town and you don't have the time to figure out how to make it yourself, surely everybody here, including myself, has an empty plastic bottle. Plastic? Well, we're not using that word. Empty plastic bottle that you don't want to throw in the garbage. You just keep the the top of it on this side, and you just hold, keep the handle on there, and you just cut around the other side, and you have a scoop instantly. Back in the old days, homesteaders would make things like this, 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 because they didn't have plastic. No plastic. They didn't have plastic. So they made it out of either this wood or heavy stock metal. That's pretty much what they had to work with. All right, so we're again here. Um, at the Huey Farm Back to Basics Day, and we are at the horseshoeing station. Uh, Sam is going to talk to us here a little bit about shoeing horses and the important things about a horse's feet, type of shoes they wear depending on the horse. And this is something that's been going on for many, 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 many years. You know, horses have been around for a long time. They were our transportation before cars. So we always had to have a farrier around to shoe our horses. A lot of times uh, the blacksmith, which we were already over there talking to a little while ago, a lot of times the blacksmith in the town was the same person that shooed the horses. Um, now um, some blacksmiths still do that and some farriers are somewhat blacksmiths, but we have a, a break up there um, these days where some people just go around and they're farriers and they put the shoes on and they go to the blacksmith to get the shoes or, or fix things and stuff like that. But anyways, I'm going to let Sam do some of the uh, detailed talking and information about horses and shoes and horses' feet. All right, thank you, Dan. So, uh, hello everyone and thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to be doing horseshoeing here. We have a horse that Dan was kind enough to bring down. Uh, we're going to shoe him here. He had shoes on and I pulled the first shoe off here and was able to trim it down and we're going to go through that with another foot as well. But before we get started here, I'd like to talk a little bit about sh the background of shoeing. Uh, when you shoe a horse, any horse, you're shoeing the horse for performance and balance. And uh, in order to shoe for that, you need to keep a few things in mind before you even get under that horse. Uh, you need to look at this horse's age, uh, how he's built, his conformation, most importantly, uh, where he lives day in and day out, and his job, what he does day in and day out. We know by looking at this horse's teeth that he is uh, over 10 years old, probably if not almost 20, and uh, we can see by his conformation that he's a little sickle hocked in the back, he's got a long pasture, so we know he can't take too much heel off that back without uh, stressing those tendons, so being that it's an older horse as well, there's only so much you can correct. And if it was a younger horse, there's more you can correct with uh, your shoeing work. But again, Sam, just one good bit of information you said about what the horse is gonna do, what's his job. So this horse's job is to pull my carriage, which is parked right next door to here. And his job before that was to pull a very similar carriage, um, uh, a black one instead of a brown and white one. His job before that was a racehorse. So he raced carts. And there's a tattoo on his body somewhere there under his mane that has his race tattoo number on there. If you wanted to, you could find out the information. That's just a little background of what Hank has done and what he's doing now. And Hank, this horse here is a standard bred. So that's another consideration you need to take in mind is this horse's breed. And so now we know all those factors. Now we can uh, shoe accordingly to that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and uh, I ask, if you don't mind, just everyone please uh, stay outside of the barn for now, and uh, as I continue on working, I'll bring the horse closer to you to get an idea of what we're doing a little closer up. So like I said before, I trimmed this foot down here, I pulled the shoe off, and I trimmed it down adequately to see, uh, to see where he needs to be. I brought the sole down to the live sole to see if there's any more we need to trim. The feet, the foot we're dealing with here, a little few parts of the foot we'll name. The frog, it's like uh, your blood pump. It's circulating blood all through the feet. Your hoof wall is your outer edge. Your white line is where you're nailing your nails to for the shoe to go on. And your sole. You don't want to remove too much sole, but you want to remove enough that it will not create sole pressure on the shoe. Because you want that shoe to be resting on that white line and your wall, not on your sole. Frog actually, just to verify, the frog actually, it's like a, a rubber 
Here's horse shoeing. It makes a huge difference in correcting the horse's feet with shoeing. You can also make it a lot worse. It's just like if you cut your fingernail too short, it's going to hurt. Yeah. Right. You know, and you can, if you lower a horse too much in his inside or his outside, you don't do it correctly, you know, that's when you're going to run into problems. And if you don't know what you're doing, and, you know, I've been shoeing, I'm, I have a lot, need a lot more experience. I've been shooting horses for three years now, and uh, what I've just come to talk to here today is about basic homesteader shoeing. You know, just for the basic homestead. You know, we're not getting into making fancy shoes or all different sorts of tools and equipment. I have various different shoes over there to kind of give you an idea of what goes on on the truck over there. And uh, but like I was saying before, you shoe a horse for performance and balance. And to get that, you need to take into consideration his conformation, his job, what he does day in and day out, and how he lives, you know, in, in his age. So we know this horse is a little straight in the back. He's got long pasturance. He's got a nice rear end. We know this horse is over 10 years old by reading the teeth. And uh, he's off work right now. He was working with the Amish, and now he's done for the year. So we're not going to do too much to him. We're going to keep him how he is. There's only so much you can correct with an older horse like this. So we're going to get started. I'm going to ask for the foot, not just grab at it. This is as much art as it is science. Well, there's a lot to it. It's not yeah. just, you know, cutting the... Uh, Cutting the foot down and slapping a shoe on, you know, it's yeah. there's a lot more to it. Sam, can you tell us the different parts of the foot there you're working at? Yeah, uh, this is the frog that I'm trimming right now. This is like a brake pad, a blood pump. This here is the sole. Your hoof wall is the outer edge, and your white line is that's where you're going to be nailing your shoe on. In the, you want to get your nails on the inside of the white line because if they're too high or they're hitting your sole, you're going to have a lame horse and you're going to run into problems. So it's very important that you get it, the nails to land where they need to be according to the shoe. And it's very important you shape the shoe to the foot. Right. You're not hmm. cutting this to fit that. Gotcha. Okay. And what's that stuff coming out the back of the horse? Uh, <laughs> those are the pipes working. There. Okay. That's normal. I think normal. that was breakfast. <laughs> Yeah. He learned from the Koreans in Jersey City. <laughs> Homestead Spa. Homestead Spa. <laughs> Come. Come. You don't waste anything. We're going to take this and put it over here and it'll end up on the compost pile for our garden one day. Thank you. 
Huey Farm, and we are now going to talk to Warren. He's going to start off with a little bit of uh, sharpening techniques. All our tools on the homestead need sharpened or taken care of in one way or another on a fairly regular basis so we can continue to use them. So it's important when you buy or make or acquire any kind of tool, you learn about how to take care of it. Um, that's a very important part because if you, you, if you just use it and use it and use it, don't take care of it and you don't feel like sharpening, then you're going to have to get another one someday instead of using the same one over for many, many years. And this is not a throwaway economy here in the wood shop on the homestead. Right. You have to fix stuff. Right now, I'm going to show you about saws, hand saws, this particular hand saw. And I, um, you can't see it from there, but each tooth, if you looked at it, this is one tooth, this is another tooth, has a set on it like this. And if it has a very shallow set, just a little bit, that's because it's a cross-cut saw. And if it's, if it's a, a rip saw, you have to put more of a set on it because it cuts a bigger curve. If you don't put the set on it, it would bind up the saw in the cut as you're trying to cut. So first thing you have to do is set the blade, but there's no setter here, so I can't show you that. A setter is a tool that clamps on and you just squeeze it at each one and it pushes it one way and then pushes it the other way. Another thing about old saws is they may be used so much that they have like a, a shape to them and they're supposed to be straight. So you can lay two pieces of steel on either side and clamp it on there, file them off straight. That makes some of them duller than others. That gives you your, your straight line. Then you cut down in with a triangular file. and get your shape back. So you have to shape teeth. Shape the teeth. You're cutting, when you're cutting this, you're, sh you're sharpening this edge and this back edge in between. Have you ever heard of a, an owl called a saw wet owl? Yep. Saw wetting is sharpening a saw and sometimes when you do it, it squeaks just like the saw wet owl, the sound they mm. make. So you have to sharpen both both sides and you move just move along one tooth after another and you get the angle right there's an angle going on that you have to keep about right and that's all by eye that's all just by eye once you have a sharp um, saw blade and a saw then you can cut your wood up into pieces and all that kind of stuff in the shop now another thing he's got here is some draw knives of all different sorts for doing different shapes and um, this isn't my equipment, so I'm just going to show you some things here. And you use all these kind of tools on a schnitzel bunk. Shaving bench. That's what this is. I don't know what he was going to make here, but I'm going to just work on it for fun. It, this clamps it down with your two feet, holds it so you can pull back. You can use a knife, the knife this way or this way. It just depends on which way you want to use it. You can shape it. I guess he's making a handle here. I'm just guessing. Like a handle, yeah. This gouge is if you're, if you're trying to like make a, um, a spoon or something that has some kind of a shape like this to it. You can just tell by the shape of it. And there's all different shapes of these. Uh, then he also has here. That's all it's used on the schnitzel bomb. The rest of this stuff, all kind of planes. You can see the shape that it would make in the wood, on the edge of the wood, like if you're doing tongue and groove or whatever kind of molding you're making. And you have to set that up on a bench where it's clamped in real nice and strong for you to down along the edge of the wood. What else is about here? Uh, for sharpening these kind of tools, you have to decide a couple things. Do you want it to shape be shaped like that or like that or like that and it all makes a difference this shape is for splitting like like a splitting mall that kind of stuff because it hits the edge and starts to pop it open right away or this shape is for like limbing limbs off of a tree or something it's really sharp it cuts it's a very much a cutter and straight is the in between and that's the average shape for most of your axes and and hatches and stuff for just general tools on the farms. 
Uh, and so sharpening, well, everything that has cutting edge needs sharpening. So you need a lot of different kind of files or stones, sharpening stones. Uh, or scissors. Scissors are a real snips. pain to sharpen. <laughs> hmm. Well, those aren't so Tin bad. Snips. Tin snips aren't so bad, except that they're very hard steel, so you have to have a good stone to sharpen those. This tin working guy is not here. Is he here? I don't know. I can go find out. But this, um, I don't know if this is the same group that was outside where we showed them some of the toolboxes and stuff that we made for use around the homestead and stuff. But they've had some things set up in here. This is a more decorative part of, of tin smithing. The other part was more making toolboxes and funnels, and he has a funnel here. But making things like that, um, you know, before the industrial age, before the plastic started, you know, people used steel things. They used funnels, and and this one was probably made on a machine. But a lot of funnels way back in the day were made by a tinsmith, the, the local tinsmith. And you had to learn how to do, I did a lot of it all my life in a sheet metal shop making duct work, but, you, but it's basically the same thing. You use a method called triangulation. And you can make any shape and size you want to out of a piece of metal. Here's a, a different shape funnel. Um, here's a scoop, a round one, a square one, a bell. Um, I mean, a lot of this you can, some of these things, the funnel's probably the, the easiest thing to make. You just need the two radiuses and the length and you can do triangulation and I don't have time to show you all that but you can just make this shape and hand form it, rivet it together and you have a funnel. If you want to put a little nipple on the end that's fine. But Dave here has a lot of displays you can look at. This is more of a decorative part of tinsmithing that you can make candle holders and who knows where What that are those things? I don't know. It kind of looks like it was going to go on the top of a chimney or something. Oh, uh, it's a rain gutter. Wow. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a lot of gutters that he has a picture of. And just different designs to use for decorative things around your house. And a lot of it's done with punches, just using little hand punches either to dimple it or to punch the whole way through. If you were using, making like a lamp shade, you could punch a lot of holes in a piece of up, put it around there as a shade, and then the light would shine through it. It would look really cool. Um, and it's done with really thin type metal. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of things and, and fun things to do. You can make so many things. Another thing that he has here in the shop is this. Uh, well, there's a couple tools here that I want to show you. This is a hand-operated drill press. As it spins, it slowly drops the bit down into the work while it's cutting it. And then this, this flywheel acts as a weight but you could also connect it to a belt if you had some kind of other power source. And then once it gets down airways, you can just flip that up and then and bring it back up out of the piece of wood. Hook a, a bicycle and make that bicycle power if you want you to. You could, but it's really easy to just stand here. And well, yeah, I, <laughs> you to do it this is one of the tools they used to give away or sell you from the old Sears Roebuck catalog for the homesteaders. Hmm. This is one of a, a blackfish. Smith's Forge and a couple simple tools was another part of the kit. There were some hand tools, uh, hand saws, chisels, axes, and stuff. This tool here, not this one, this one. Whenever you're building a home or a barn, uh, timber framing, this is for boring the holes into the timber frames where you're going to put the pegs and put them together. And some of these operate so that you can change the angle like if you're going into something that's a brace and has to have an angle on it. This one just goes straight up and down. So you sit this on top of the board, you sit on top of it holding it down and then you just... And it's the same kind of thing. It drives down and spins at the same time. What other cool tools? These things, anybody have an idea what these are for? Hmm. Not fleshing boards, but close enough. Stretching boards. A fleshing beam was like a long beam in the ground in front of you. You leaned on it and you pushed the fat and the meat off of the hide, first side down, and then you put it on, then you salt it or whatever you're going to do to it, and you put it on meat and then you dry it. I thought it was for snowboarding. Snowboarding? Uh, this is an apple picker or fruit picker here. Yeah. Real long handle. There's like probably a lot of stuff you can look at if I look hard enough. Lots of old things. Mike, uh, Mike helps at auction, so whenever somebody doesn't want to buy anything old, they just don't want it, he gets it for 50 cents or a dollar and brings it home. Mm -hmm. And he gets some really cool stuff. That's why he has 30 saws up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing?
making chips. I slice garlic, mm -hmm. anything oh, right. that yeah. you want to dehydrate, you slice it on there, you know, make something seem like that, you slice yeah. it in there. Cabbage, I got that you slice it on there. So. And then we just fry them until they're done and then put a little salt on, eat them, and enjoy them. Yeah. So, but there's not much to them except Very you have to be sure if you large too hot, then they burn. Mm -hmm. And if you want to flavor them while they're cooling down, you can sprinkle them with whatever yeah. flavor okay. you want. We didn't have any extra flavoring this time, but. Mm -hmm. Very simple. A lot of chips you buy in the grocery store are made with oils that aren't good for you. All different kinds of bad oils. So if you use lard, lard's good for you, so you're getting that plus the chip. Plus the potato. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got that at the uh, antique show center. Oh, cool. So cabbage, like a lot of other things, have an inherent uh, bacteria on it, a lactobacillus bacteria. And the whole point of, of sauerkraut is to put it in a salt environment that's not hospitable to bad bacteria, but it will allow the lactobacillus to flourish. And that's also a good gut organism for you. Um, so really the best way to eat sauerkraut is like this, it's not cooked. Once you cook the sauerkraut, you're killing all those good bugs. Mm. Now, there's, that doesn't mean you can't have cooked sauerkraut mm. now and again, but uh, uh, it's you know it, it makes a good condiment. You just get in the habit of putting that, you know, on a, a spoon of that on your plate next to your other foods and eat, and eat it raw. But the thing with uh, you know doing 10 gallons of sauerkraut is it's entertaining to watch, but how many of you are actually going to do that? <laughs> so this here, you're making sauerkraut one quart at a time. So you can get a he single head of cabbage, or maybe you have another use of cabbage. How many times do you get a head of cabbage because you wanted to have some coleslaw or make a small pot of ham and cabbage? You put the other half in the fridge, and four months later, after it's changed colors, you finally throw it away. <laughs> so this way, you could take that other half of cabbage and just make a little bit of sauerkraut. Um, all I'm doing is shredding it by hand. Pack your jar full. There's, you know, there's a lot more process when you're making. Uh, sauerkraut by a big batch. This is so there's no salt in here or anything. Just packing that full of, sh of shredded cabbage, packing it down pretty well. When you get done, you throw two teaspoons of salt on top of that, pour boiling hot water over top of it. Now that will kill some of the bacteria on the top, but until it gets to the bottom, it's not going to kill it all. But it does. Um, um, it, it's a trouble-free process to go ahead and dissolve that salt. Put your cap on loosely, uh, put it in a tote or something because it will spill over when, it, when the ferment is active. Um, leave it at room temperature for at least a week and it should be pretty well done uh, most of the ferment at that time. Take a quart of water and a tablespoon of salt, bring it to a boil and let it cool to room temperature. At that point you don't want to be killing any more of those good bacteria. Once it comes to room temperature, just top off your jars, screw your cap down tight, put them in the in the basement. Um, well, it, with your initial um, start of it, you don't want to screw your cap on. Your right, you've got to leave that open to let the, because yeah, it's going to gas up. Now, I don't make this quantity of sauerkraut with the intent of, of keeping it a long time, but just to show you, that's been in the basement for three years and that's still edible. And it was not pressured, it was not heat treated. So, um, you know, it's a, the thing is to, do it at the right time in the process, and I've kept that environment in that jar, you know, inhospitable to bad bacteria. So, the other thing I'm doing here is making scrapple on a small scale. So when I, first of all, any animal, and I don't want to burn the samples over here, um, the best way to preserve an animal 
You know, freezers are good, canning's good, and all that stuff, but it's all a process. The best way to preserve out any any uh, anything is alive. You know, you want to preserve garden produce, keep it in the ground. Yep. You know, you want to preserve uh, a steer, keep it alive. You know, don't everybody raise a steer and kill it and then wonder what you're going to do with 400 pounds of meat. Okay, but if you cooperate with four families, everybody raises a steer. You kill an animal, you share it with all four families. After it's consumed, you kill the next one. You know, work in cooperation. Um, so in this case, I kill a chicken. Anybody ever use the feet of a chicken? No. Um, you, those feet are full of collagen, which really will put body in a soup or a broth, but it's also very good for you. And uh, it, it may seem goofy, but you scald that in uh, about 150 degree water for about 30 seconds, pop the toenails off, and that scaly skin will peel off like taking a glove off your hand, and you'll have perfectly clean feet and you, uh, you can put them you know, in, in the freezer uh, until you accumulate enough, or, or if you've got soup coming up, you just take what you have and put them in the soup. But, or just dry them up in the pan. Yeah, you can do that too and gnaw on them. Once they're yeah. soft enough, you get to put them in your mouth and work the good stuff off. Oh. <laughs> Popular in Latin American countries, especially in, in some Asian countries. Uh, oh, fuzzy. Someday I'll be no, tall enough. I am her. I, I'm tall enough. They are tall enough. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm almost. Almost. You will be soon. Bye. 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 Almost tall. Bye. 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 No. Bye. I want to be as tall as you. I will. I will. You will. I One will make. <laughs> Keep eating your spinach. Oh, so, Ben Frank. So, here is our um, apple cider press. This, this type of press has been around for probably at least 150 years, and it's pretty much the same design from what I've researched. Um, I have seen a, a few different things. One of them had a, a box with a, it actually had a um, car jack on top of it that they cranked up and down to press the juice out of it. But this thing, um, Mike's been using this for ages, and I've used it quite a few times, and it just keeps on ticking. I see they got it kind of braced together a little more, but it's very simple. Um, Ben's going to do some cranking here, and it's, it's very easy. Um, sometimes we, we show people this, and we give them a sample of apple cider, and they put it all in there. And I, I tell them again, just take an apple and throw it in there and crank it. And they drink it, so what else is in there? Like it, that's it. Apple. And um, technically, Help throw a couple apples yeah. in there. Just don't do it while you're cranking. Just stop the cranking for a minute and let yep. them throw some. Come on, you can throw some apples in there. Help us out. You can um, get any of the apples. Technically, what we're making is apple juice. <coughs> apple cider technically has to be cooked to be called cider. Um, but it's called apple cider where we're at because that's just what people called it for many, many years. And I've researched this because I was curious why it's called apple cider and it, it, it technically is apple juice. And it's just called cider because that's what people have been calling it that for years and it's got the name and it's going to keep it, I'm sure. So apple cider is when you, you cook like apple, what do they call it, mold cider or whatever. You cook, cook the apple juice, add cinnamon or whatever and make a little... Um, Be careful if this feels sweet. A little potty. So that's all you do. Now, who wants to help crank? Boys, want to help crank? Why don't you go around that way, and and Ben will show you how to crank. Because it's real easy. Even the little guys can make apple cider. So you're gonna grab this here. And we're just gonna make it the circle. There you go. Yep. Ready? Can you do that? You one need your at brother a time. too. One at a time, maybe. We don't want to get our fingers in there. Here, watch that guy, guys. Right here. There you go. Soupy me? There it is. Look at that. Old school fireplace. It's got a bar coming out. And that swings in and out. So you can put the big kettle right over the fire.
first come out open it's a full and then it's uh So in the ocean pretty much is just the mass heated up yeah, yeah. and then coat. So it's just spray board and fire on just put this heat the radio back in. Well, I've seen careful now. <laughs> Look at that. You're gonna melt your little camera. <laughs> that looks awesome. I think my fingers are gonna start yeah. melting for the camera. Hopefully. Oh, <laughs> That's what I said about the last one. And this is just All right, so we're making bread right now. We are making bread. We are making bread. And we're scooching the fire back a little bit. So we make a little room for the loaves. And it's fine to put it right on the ash. Is that kind of like a Well, I'm going to do that. Or? I'm going to do that with these uh, that is going to stay in its pan, but I was I was thinking of putting those right on the ash. What do you think? Yeah. I, I tell you what, let's experiment. One on ash and... Exactly. Now these are going to cook really fast. Oh, really? Uh, yes, because this fire is so hot. In fact, it might be pushing it. Let's just experiment with one first. All right. Oh, so that could collapse. It's just air holding it just like air. that? Wow. Let's just try that. Let's keep a watch on it. That one's gonna cut that one's gonna cook really fast. So typically I think they let oftentimes they get the oven heated up and then pull the fire out. For today oh, really? I, for today I think it's just about you like wanna keep cooking? keeping a low yeah. fire. Is Josh McCracken? Josh was in one of the videos where he had a big uh, smoker. That's right. That's right. Crick fest. <laughs> That's right. Always fire. Has to be fire. Involved. Yeah. <laughs> fire is fun. For, uh, one loaf gets yeah. sacrificed oh, to the bread gods. Yep. Exactly. And that's the guy in there. These guys would be for our so. That's how you make. That's how you make. Uh, you appease the gods. Make yeah. Them happy. Long life and gluten free bread. That's how you get the gluten out. You have to <laughs> sacrifice one to the beer. Yeah. Everybody, here she is, the one and only Kathy. <laughs> um, so, we're making soap here today. Um, we're using a couple animal products in our soap. Uh, one is lard, which is the fat from a pig, and the other is tallow, which is uh, made from beef fat. And if you come down here, I'll show you these. Right, right there. Inside there down so that's up. beef. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a beef oh, tallow. Oh wow. It's hard. It's crackles. It's kind of like coconut it's, oil. It's rendered fat, rendered beef fat, and then this is tallow. I'm sorry, this is lard. And that's um, a lot fat, softer. And that is uh, softer and gooier. That's just the nature of the beast. Hmm. Okay. So those are the two animal products that are in the soap. And I also put coconut oil in it, which is very Ooh. similar in uh, appearance to, to the, the tallow. tallow. Yeah. And you use coconut oil if you want uh, soap that's going to lather. That's its main oh, really? function. Okay. And olive oil is the fourth ingredient that we're using today just because it has nice properties for skin. So all of those are melted together in the pot. Um, the second component of soap yeah, is the lye solution. And I use a commercial powdered lye, red devil or whatever. When we're done here, here, let's go outside. All right. Real quick and show you how lye used to be made. And it still can be made this way. So water is uh, filtered through wow. hardwood ash in some sort of vessel. In the bottom, it's lined with straw, which you can't see. And then you fill it with ash. And then you pour water through it, and it will slowly trickle out of a hole in the bottom. And that will be the lye that you make the soap with. And you can test Whoa. the strength of that by dropping an egg into it. And depending on how it uh, sinks, how fast it sinks, you'll know if it's too strong, too weak, or just right. It, just sl it should sink slowly. It will be just right. So but cool. to get a consistent product, because I do sell it, I use the commercial product so I know the strength and I know how much to use to get what I'm But here at Homestead we make it ourselves. We can make it ourselves. That's right. Yep. We do make the lard and tallow ourselves. So on the east coast back way back a couple hundred years ago most of the soap was made with the animal products and on the west coast because they had palm and olive trees mm -hmm. they made them with vegetable products. Oh. Wow. Palm olive soap company. Mm -hmm. Palm olive 
Ha 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 ha! Wow, okay, yeah. I never knew that. Um, I have a lot of things to say, but I don't say everything. So anyway, so we have a fat solution, we have the lye solution, which is the lye mm -hmm. bar. When you add the lye to the water, the temperature goes up to 190 degrees. Because of a chemical reaction? Yeah. It gets very hot. You have to cool that. Basically, you want the, the fat solution and the lye solution to be basically the same temperature. Oh, yeah. I'm good. Some people say 85, 90. Mm -hmm. I'm not a stickler with that as long as they're both pretty similar. Like, I think this one's going to be more like 110. Mm -hmm. um, so when you combine the two, you get yet another chemical reaction. So you don't have lye anymore, and you don't have fat. You have this, it's called a salt, which is the soap of the chemical reaction. Ah. And um, so I guess I'll do that now. All right. Just combine the two. And it should be very caustic stuff <clears throat> right here. Um, so you want to be careful when you're pouring it in. Not to splash it. I mean, it does splash, and it's happened several times to me, and you just have to wipe it off pretty directly. And I've already checked the temps, and they're okay. So when you combine these two, you get sort of this translucent liquid. Oh. Which isn't soap yet. And you can stir, and you can stir, and you can stir for a really long time. Or you can use a stick blender and do it in like seconds. So not an approved home setting tool. Nope. It's <laughs> fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you want to zoom in here, you'll see how it goes from sort of. Uh, Very, yeah, I can translucent. see it. Very, yeah. And then it'll get uh, milky looking, <laughs> like oh, more wow. like a pudding. Wow, really pretty. Is that you just air getting it's, introduced? It's, it's turning into soap. And I don't want to go too far with this because I want to add some scent and some lavender to it. You want to do that before it's completely mm. thick. So I'm making a lemon lavender soap this, this batch around. So I'm going to pour a couple lavender petals in there. And this is a lemon lavender essential oil. And this could take seconds, it could take a few minutes. It all depends on the temperatures. Oh. It depends on a lot of things. Okay. Yeah, you can't get too close to this, you might scratch. So basically, you want this to, it's called tracing. You want it to form a little, you don't want it to fall through the soil. You see, it's not quite ready, but it's really, really, okay, it's close. Okay, so now, get, see how thick it got? See, it'll form a, it'll stay on top. Oh, yeah, you can yeah, see, see a little. Oh, okay. So now it's ready to pour into a mold or a form. And since I cut blocks, I just use a square mold. Handmade by Dad. <laughs> That's Homesitter Dan. Check him out on Instagram. Dad. Oh, Dad. Dad. Oh, okay. Dan. You can still check out Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Daddy, you need help seeing? Oh, I thought you didn't want to see. <laughs> so you pour it into your mold. Roll out. Okay. I've read where you're not supposed to scrape your pan. I can't figure for the life of me why not. <laughs> Blast it out and then give it a shake and then you're going to cover it. Do you need to insulate it? Hmm. Which I will do better when I'm on camera. Um, insulate it and then this is going to heat up again. It gets really hot and we're going to shut oh. the door because it's getting a draft right now, which you don't want. Um, so it'll heat up again and in a few hours it'll be hard. I usually cut it after about two days. Although this I made last night, so I can show people today what it what it actually looks oh. like. So it's already hard. Get wow. the block right up and slice this into bars, and then stand it up. Yep. Stand it up and let it dry for about a month. The drier it gets, the longer it'll last. You can use it pretty correctly, mm. although I wouldn't. It still has to kind of just mellowing out process. 
but the harder it gets, the longer it's going to last. And homemade soap should always be kept on something that will drain because it'll melt fast if it's not, uh, if it doesn't drain. Very cool. Um, here is a bar that was my Keely's grandmother, so they figured she probably made it about 60 years ago. I don't know what kind of soap it is. It what? looks like it might have been a milk soap. And it's very waxy. It might even have been a beeswax soap. I don't know. It feels like it might have been a milk soap. This is 60 years old? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a bar of soap, which we won't say who made it. But this is what you don't want. It's very chalky. There was way too much lye in this formula. That's what happens when you don't oh. measure properly. Is that how they make chalk? I mean, it really is like chalk. This would burn. This will burn you if you try to use this. Oh. This is not good. <laughs> this is what you don't do. Follow you around all day. What are you doing here? Are you a homesteader? Where are you? <laughs> She's running away. Yeah, here's the sewing. We're quilting. We're quilting. Rugs. Oh, yeah. very nice. We're applicating quilt patches onto. We're making quilted pot holders. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, you just keep that. That's fine. That's something I've done. Oh, yeah. What color? Oh, very nice. Patches for quilt started. Mm-hmm. More patches for quilt started. Not my potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> the potato chips are made here too? Yep, down right, here at the yeah. bottom. Mm -hmm. yep. Alright, so thank you. You're welcome. There they are again. Got that one, got that one. Here are some of the show cows of Woodward. The famous ladies. What are you doing, baby? What are you doing, baby? There's some sawdust. Wow. <laughs> so happens when you work at a sawmill. Yeah, so for instance, um, so there are different ways to save seed, and we've got two really good examples here um, in that. So you take something like a sunflower yeah. that... Um, I always wonder how to do that. You just pick them out. Well, yeah, yeah so you does. wait until, hmm. right, until it's dry, <laughs> um, and you can do the, obviously tell in multiple different ways of how to do that. Um, and pick them out and store them in a dry place and label them. Um, but then there's other things like, so tomatoes, you have an open pollinated variety of tomato, um, but there's all obviously a, a coating. Yeah, so there's a coating around it. And the most important thing is to make seeds viable from when you're- Ah, you're again! What are you doing? What are you doing there, Patrick? Okay. Here are the tools of the trade of the wood shop, people. Look at that. Wrangler Star, are you jealous or what? Look at that. There's the family. The Huey family. Is that a wood shop? Tin smithing. This is for if you're living for life, you guys need this. You'll probably have one. No, you'll probably have machines. Look at that. Like butter, baby. Like butter. Fred Flintstone bench. It's for the Flintstone in you. They were making pine tar here. What you do is you have a hole and you do something and you put pine and it makes tar. As you can tell, I was not an instructor on this. <laughs> what are you laughing at? This logo delicious. Logo's making cookies all day. Chocolate chip. 
I had about 40 of them. <laughs> that's a John Deere. That's a John. Oh, that's an old John Deere. Look at that boy. Wow, that's cool. All right, buddy. That's pretty much it. That was the. Oh, you can walk by. This is totally unofficial. Okay. This is craziness going on here. But here's the after party. We're all just chilling on the porch. She is over 21, I hope. She's allowed to drink. See, this kid's friendly. Eddie Santos, I'm gonna have to, I, I edited it out for you. I'm sorry. She gave one of those. So, here. <laughs> So that's it. That's the uh, 2017 Back to Basics, Woodward Back to Basics Festival. Is it a festival? Is it a festival? Back to Basics thing. I'm talking to myself. It's what I'd normally do. <laughs> Porch of 90 people. Nobody's paying attention to me. <laughs> I'm going to go and cry in the corner now. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. We um, had a lot of good food. A lot of good drinking and... All kind of good stuff here at the homestead. Learned a lot. Hope you guys learned a lot too. And all that jibber jabber about YouTube channel. You know, like share it, like it, subscribe if you don't, and tell your friends. Pass along the information. Um, I'm gonna put up some drone footage right now for you guys to check out the layout of the land. And I will see you later. Dennis Allen. <laughs> Warren will shoot it down. <laughs> I was gonna say, Anybody's gonna do it. <laughs> he it He's gonna do it. That is so cool. I just think it's yeah, neat to watch the. It's amazing what you can see. Like, Look how good the camera is too. This is a 4K camera. They're amazing. And it stays. And you were telling me about it. I'm just sitting for time. Like it has a thing so that like the camera always stays stable. Yeah, I mean, it's look. Like a circular whoops, kind of. That's the wrong way. If I look at it going sideways, yeah, and look at it on the screen. Oh no there. way! Yeah, I mean, yeah, look amazing. at the screen. Wow, that's that absurd. Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> that show at all. Yeah, that's cool. it's it's crazy. crazy. And it pretty much flies itself, and everybody <laughs> wants to shoot it down. <laughs> Too many shotgun noises over there. <laughs> uh oh, here we go. Here, yeah. I'm out of here. That's cool. cool. That's cool. Yeah. Modern homestead. <laughs> this is uh, so you oh, can see the high. homestead. How high does oh, it go? Right high, uh, you could probably do a couple miles. A couple miles, it will not go straight up a couple miles. Um, yeah, that's like thin uh, atmosphere. Right, man. yeah, <laughs> no, a couple miles is not thin, it's 6,000 feet. Well, a couple miles is 10,000. 3,000 <laughs> is a mile, right? Roughly 5,200. Oh, 5,000. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. so yeah, 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 no, I'm yes. I don't think it would go. That's so crazy. No. Well, this it'll amazing. go. Where's our house? Yeah, no, it won't go. Yeah, it <laughs> won't go that high. <laughs> it won't go that high. Your house is over there. There it is. Yeah, you can see it. <laughs> that is so cool. Hello. 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 Hey, hey. Good. How are you guys? Good. Good. This has been fun. It's been quite a great day, huh? Cool. Well, it was getting into clouds. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh, look. So high up there. Oh wow. We are in the clouds in now. The clouds. <laughs> oh wow. That's pretty awesome. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Not going any more than that. It's a little too it's a little freaky to me. I don't know. It's like, nice. it's strange. Oh, I love the mercury. Taking out. I mean, got a lobby too. A couple years ago my my uh is it coming down? <laughs> there it was. there for a while. It decided, you know what I kind of like? The funniest, the funniest clip I've seen was actually Wrangler Star. He bought a brand new drone when it first came out. And he's flying it. And the thing just keeps going. He's like, why isn't it stopping? <laughs> What's going on? And it keeps, keeps going and going and going. Oh, geez. It's in the jet. Stupid shoes. It's in the jet stream. Oh, I should have shown the, should have the instructions. Why is it flying away? It's flying away. Oh, I, I can't even. Oh. It's just. It's just gone.
<laughs> Yo, it went it went above the clouds. We couldn't uh we're in the stratosphere. Where the heck are we? Ooh, swarm is what there? Oh all right, we're in this area. That's their house, okay. I, I hear it. Yeah? I see it. <laughs> if I can do both together at the same time it was just shut off and drop. Can you see me? I did that one time when I got stuck in trees. What happened? <laughs> tree. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then what did you have to do? And I had to shut off the engines because it was underneath it. I didn't want to hit the tree and just so right. so I shut it off right before and I just caught it. Wow. <laughs> Are you flying? Oh what? Right. Yeah. Yeah, we were up there. You should check it out. So you can see the Comes down a lot faster video. than slow. It's really neat. What in the world? <laughs> I know. It's, oh my god. Right, you go from homesteading to you know the 21st century really quickly. Oh, dude, that. Bugs me out, man. I know it's. We, you have to have technology to document it. High that's talk, right. High tech, <laughs> yeah. That's that's the excuse. It's really cool. Other than the fact I just that think it's cool, fun. fun to play with. <laughs> oh yeah. It's gonna be careful. Oh, that's a cool angle. Crash, yeah. Yeah, that's another cool angle. Show me my house. Oh, <laughs> I think we it's can do natural. sink what we if we can do this what <laughs> is the government the really doing to us is what <laughs> scares oh, yeah. me no, you're, you don't want to think about it yeah i don't even want to think about then it. then you get paranoid you start digging deep holes in the ground not a good thing <laughs> 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 to say realize there's 330 million of us here yeah right they're quite satisfied watching 328 million mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i'm fine with that because i want to be part of that two million yeah. that is just mom they don't bother with yeah i've got nothing they want why? I hope so. Yeah, right, yeah. Dude, look and see what I hope paid they don't is. bother us. That's what my. Uh... Especially where the world just seems to get crazier and crazier. I'm so happy we're out here in the middle of it. It seems the more you're integrated into society, the more they want to track you. So oh, yeah. I'm staying outside as much as I can and I gotta follow so I, get I give them no reason to think I'm a threat to leave me alone. I sell the flip phone. I need a phone, it's never a smartphone. Dude, I owned a computer store for 27 years. I got my first. I see a power cable. Why? It's flying. It wants to look around. It's flying or you control I'm controlling it. Why can you blind your phone on them? Whoa, it's down. <laughs> um, because I'm recording. Oh yeah. That's pretty easy. Oh, this thing is amazing. Oh, 
wind Where up cool. Where's the wind? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's right my there. head. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Huh. See that? He's well, up. Mom. Oops, I'm trying to. He's up above. Here he comes. Ooh. This thing's up above. You can watch it just pop him. There's your house. See that way you can see the top of your roof needs cleaning right now. Yeah. <laughs> Good for roof repair. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. Oh no, it's not big. Oh, there's a camera over here saying yeah. recording. Oh, I gotta go. I don't know where the tree is. Yeah. I thought this was supposed to be the old time, not the new time. <laughs> this is just documenting the old time. The old time was the tree. Yeah. I should not be flying where I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Good for cleaning chimneys. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's, it's recording hey, video. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah really. Oh, they're coming back around. Uh, we'll get you. <laughs> this is modern home standing. It's good for cattle, oh, <laughs> sheep. <laughs> oh, they're. I wonder if they're a little curious about them. What's the run time on this one? Uh, like 15 minutes. You're on? Yeah, I got eight minutes left actually. Usually a couple minutes more and I'll bring it back. Those pigeons just keep flying around. Yeah, they don't quite know if they make Yeah, if the battery goes dead, it'll do it automatically. I mean, the easiest is just to catch it. <laughs> well, I could, yeah, I could have it Your license. <laughs> they don't require one apparently. <laughs> I think you're supposed to something with the FCC, but. Let's crash.